Kristen, it's our time to rise when it comes to preteens and teens, isn't it? It is. It's fun to be on here with both of you. Well, we we're... all know exactly what it's like to rise up with teenagers. I know. I know. I feel like this is just going to be such a popular episode because every parent of teenager is like, I'm rising up. I'm yes. coming to yes. rise up with this, with the sisterhood today, because we know it's hard, whether we're parenting preteens or parenting teens or young adults. Um, there are things that are so amazing about this age group. Like we just eat it up, right? Like all the things. And I know you, you do such a good job of celebrating this phase in life with your children. And I love that about you. And for people that want to know more about that, go to Kristen's social media, but it's also filled with surprises and challenges. Absolutely. I mean, in a large degree, it gets harder and harder. And that might feel really scary to hear, but it's just the emotional exhaustion and the just not knowing at all what to do because there are no formulas and, and it's hard to have discernment and some really hard high stakes issues. Totally. And I think that's what we want to hit on today is we want to really hit on some of those high stakes issues. And I would love to just hear, I mean, you are a therapist. And you're also a mom of young adults and teenagers. And how common is it to be surprised by something that we're dealing with, with our teens or young adults? Oh gosh, this morning, even at a mom's gathering, I heard from several moms with nine and 10 year olds who were surprised that they are already being hit with preteen, teenage type mm -hmm. issues, but our world is so rapidly changing. And I think parents often feel like they are living in a reactive stance instead of a proactive stance. And so we are often blindsided. I hear that all the time, all the time with, and I primarily counsel teenage girls, young adults. And so I hear from a lot of parents who are seeking counseling because they were surprised by something. I mean, all of a sudden we think, how is it possible that our precious little one is now doing X, Y, Z that we never imagined would be an issue that he or she dealt with, or that we as parents would have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So do you think it tends to be more the, I can't believe my child <laughs> would do that? Or does it tend to be, I can't believe my child would do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> is it more the, what they're, what they're involved in or the fact that it's, um, parents had never envisioned it in their own home? I think all, all of that. <laughs> I mean, I think we, we have this idea and really, if we go back to the Bible tells us that our hearts are deceitful beyond measure, that we're worse than we think that we are, that mm -hmm. this ever since the fall, like we are prone to sin. We have to start there because I think the problem mm -hmm. is we think like, oh, we should be perfect and we are good. And we, that we would never do those things. Well, actually the opposite is true. Like we are prone to do these things that that are bad, that we do have wrong desires and, but by grace, are we ever, you know, stopped from doing those things? And so I think when we change our mindset on that, it actually helps us to not be so shocked because we're like, yes, we're sinners. So of course mm -hmm. we're going to be tempted and given to sin and do these things that, that are wrong. Mm -hmm. That's I think really helpful. And after I'd been parenting teens a while, <laughs> I really flipped that script and it's been helpful talking to other parents too, that like, let's say that a parent comes to me, cause this is what is it, you know, real life situations here. Well, they say, I discovered my child has been looking at hard porn. And one of the things I always say is, and I fill in the blank, this child's name, this child's name is amazing. And they're looking at porn. Like those two things exist at the same time, because I think one of the things that I heard and maybe I'm not hearing as much just because I think now a lot more of my friends have teenagers. And so they're more, you know, in the swimming in the same waters. But before it was like, well, my kid wouldn't do that. He's a good kid. <laughs> my kid wouldn't look at porn. He's a good kid. And I'm like, good kids look at porn. Like, yes, they're an amazing kid. And they look at porn. Like those two things can be true at the same time. Absolutely. And so, yeah. And so just like, 
accepting that. And just what you were saying, like accepting that, nope, you know what? We all have sinned. We've all gone our own way in whatever way. And this just happens to be what they're in right now. Right. Right. And just because we're believers, I mean, we still have indwelling sin. And so I do think the parents think, oh, my child would never do that because they think because they're a Christian or they go to a Christian school or they go to a Christian camp or they go to a Bible study. Well, those things don't keep us from falling into temptation and sin. It really starts. And I say this all the time. It starts with the heart of the parent. If we know our own heart, if we know our own propensity, then we have so much more compassion and grace on our children because we know the temptation to go that way, to give into our desires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the idea too, that there's good kids and bad kids. I mean, yeah, people just aren't categorized that way. We're all sinners saved Mm -hmm. by grace. And so I think just that mindset of my child has free will and my child lives in this world where there is temptation. And so far in this conversation, we've really been talking about behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. External Mm -hmm. behaviors that are manifesting themselves in a way that now we can see what maybe what's going on in their thoughts or their heart by some of their behaviors. But really, Kristen, what you are always pointing parents back to is what's the heart and the connection with the child that because our tendency sometimes, I would say even more so as Christian parents, is to maybe hone in on the behavior and Mm. What consequence does that have as we're parenting when we focus in on, I can't believe you did (laughs) whatever it is. And how does a child process that when they hear that from a parent? Yeah. You know what? They learn to be a lot more sneaky and they hide. And that's (laughs) when kids don't talk to their parents because their parents are not safe and they learn how to play the game. I mean, I see it all the time is that kids know how to behave and perform in front of their parents, adults at church, and yet they're living a dual life. And so really we're raising Pharisees when we're so focused on just behavior and behavior modification. If we're not dealing with the heart, then there's not going to be a heart transformation or change. And so like from the parable of the two sons, we have the older brother and the younger brother and our sin tendency is one or the other. We're either going to be self-righteous and prideful and do the right things, but our heart can be just as far from God, or we're going to be outwardly rebellious. We tend to, as a society, look at that as bad. That's, that's Mm -hmm. bad, but really it can be far more destructive to have a kid doing all the right things on the outside, but inside or secretly it, it's, they're, they're just as bad, just, I mean, doing just as many destructive things. And, and I see that those are the kids that very often leave the church when they go to college and beyond, because they've been doing all the right things mm. and they're tired of hiding and pretending. And so then they mm. run and they be- end up becoming the younger brother, the more rebellious. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> and and I mean, I think, I think, um, because I, I just want to be really transparent and say that I've been all over the place as a parent, like I, mm-hmm. and, and I think I want parents to hear that. Like, I want everyone to know I've made every mistake in the book mm-hmm. when it comes to parenting teenagers, because I have, mm-hmm. and I've also learned from my mistakes and I've tried to do better, but As parents were on a journey, and I remember asking Kurt Thompson on an interview, I love him and he's the one that combines neuroscience and faith. And I remember, you know, Alex and I were laughing on an interview with him just saying, how do we not screw up our kids? Right. Because he was talking about the brain science when you do certain things as parents to your kids. And he said, don't have them. (laughs) <laughs> he said, don't have them. If you don't want to screw them, like that's the only way basically to not, you know, screw it up is to not have them. But his point was, um, we can always come back to these places where we, we heal and where we come back together in through true authentic connection. Right. So I just want parents to feel encouraged that as they're hearing some of these things, they, you know, will hear, yeah, maybe there's been some mistakes made. And I will just say, mm-hmm. I've made a lot of those same mistakes, but just be encouraged that like we can heal and we can come back together, even when we have been maybe a parent who has focused more on behavior modification than the heart. 
Yes. And I would say, actually, even our sin and our mistakes, God can use for good. And I talk a lot about living redemptively in our homes. So what does that mean? It means as parents, we go first, we confess, we say, I am so sorry. I disciplined Mm -hmm. you out of anger or the way I responded to that was not right. When we go first, that alone helps create that repair that that he talks about. I mean, and so we, even our mistakes are not beyond repair and, and I'm the same way. I mean, in my new parenting book, I'm honest to talk about the ways that I have grown and changed through parenting teens because of, I've seen how things that I've reacted to or said and done to one of my kids has been hurtful and harmful. And we've had to deal honestly with that. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, so I got to read your book early and there is a section that talks about overparenting and underparenting that is literally worth the price of the book. If, if people just read that section, that is so it's just gold. And so can you talk a little bit about the two styles and how we kind of go from one to the other? Yeah. And thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but so I use the terms overparenting and underparenting. Overparenting would be synonymous with helicopter parenting. Underparenting, contrary to how it may sound, because I think we could tend to think that means a neglectful or uninvolved parent. I don't mean it like that. It's more the permissive parent. So both parents, they love their children. But Mm -hmm. what we do or don't do as parents, our parenting style fleshed out either in overparenting control, helicoptering, or more the permissive style is driven by what rules our hearts. So back to, it starts with parents' Mm -hmm. hearts. What is going on in our hearts? Things like fear or the desire for a happy family or happy kids, or we worry about what other people think about us or our kids. We put everything into our kids' performance, their success. We want peace. We want comfort. I mean, there's a million different things that at any given moment can rule our heart. And so whatever it is that we seek to give us what we want, what we think will, will, you know, make our kids happy or give us the, the security or the identity that we're looking for in our kids is what we're functionally trusting in and hoping in. And so those controlling idols then fleshed out is what drives our parenting. So for instance, um, the tendency to overparent, it may stem and likely it does stem from fear and control. So functionally, we are trusting in ourselves to be a better God than the God of the universe. And so we try to micromanage. We think that he's not acting. He's not doing what we want. And we worry about our children's safety, their future, their performance, their behavior, all these things. They won't end up in jail, right? Yeah. Oh yes. I mean, all the things. I mean, like we can just go there, can't we? Like, oh, this means, you know, whatever we can catastrophize. uh, Yes. The what ifs. And if I don't do this, if I don't, you know, control it, micromanage it, then this is what's going to happen. Um, and so that leads to our overparenting. We're trying to secure all, whatever it is that we, that we need for our kids and us to keep it all, all okay. Um, with underparenting, fear may also drive. And I think this is super interesting um, in my counseling research. I mean, we know that college students, young adults are struggling more than ever before with anxiety, depression, low self-efficacy, entitlement, self- suicidal ideation. What's interesting is they're coming from both styles of parents. So it's not just Mm. this type of parent is producing this kind of kid. Research shows that these kids had both these type of parents. And so in my research, I was super curious, like what's the connection? Because these are such different types of parents. And my hypothesis and what I really believe is true is fear. So it's again, back to our heart, fear is driving us. It just manifests very different in the two different styles. And so for maybe the permissive parent, um, the fear is if I impose boundaries on my child, then my child's not going to like me. Or Mm -hmm. if I, you know, say no, then um, I'm going to rock the peace in our household. And I want my kid to be my BFF. So it just, that fear of conflict is huge, isn't it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Or we may want to be the cool parent, you know, mm-hmm. that might be, mm-hmm. we, we care what, you know, their friends think about us. Hmm. Yeah. Fear of perception and relationship 
and anticipating that if I do this, it's, it's the same, it's catastrophizing, right? If I do this, if I say no to my child, then they'll never speak to me again, Uh or they'll, (laughs) that they will go and do this thing on their own undercover. And, um, I would rather know about it, which I, yeah. Well, and I'm even thinking that that fear of loss of relationship is real, right? Mm -hmm. Because really the fear is I'm going to lose this relationship if I put a boundary down or if I set a standard that this child needs to meet. And so like, then it's almost like you can talk yourself into that because that feels like a good motive to not do it. Well, my motive is right. Cause I don't want to lose relationship. So how do you address that, Kristen? Yeah. And that's so right. I feel like a lot of times our, our, our motivation, it, it's, it's not necessarily wrong. And yet when it becomes the controlling ruling idol is, is what leads us to spiral out of control. But I mean, kids need boundaries and I like the analogy. I'm sure y'all have heard it of the fish in the aquarium. And if the fish didn't have the walls of the aquarium and he was outside of his, you know, case out of the water, he would die. But within those boundaries of the aquarium, he swims freely the way God created him to do. Our kids need those boundaries and, and they're going to buck up against us. And yet they, they really want them too. I mean, they're never going to admit that until later. And I actually Mm -hmm. have had my daughter admit that to me later, but in the moment, you know, they want to do what all their friends are going to do. So they're going to say, everybody else is doing it and you're the only one. And, Mm -hmm. um, but, but really it it protects them. And that's exactly what my daughter heard from friends when she got to college is that other girls were saying, now I wonder if my parents, like, did they not care about me? Did they not love me enough? to have me be home at a certain time. And so they're able, the older they get to make those connections of like, why was my parent not worried about me out in the middle of the night? Why didn't they have Mm -hmm. a boundary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the challenge I think for parents as they pass through the tween and teen years is that those boundaries grow, right? If you're, if you're allowing your child to explore new things, you still have to have boundaries, but the curfew is going to get later as they get older, right? If everything's yes. going well. So how do you guide parents in knowing and determining how to expand those boundaries appropriately? Because you could just say, well, no curfew anymore, or or you could clench down and really be micromanaging your child and their time. How do you walk that? Because there's no guidebook to what's the appropriate curfew for a 16 year old girl? Where do I find that in the Bible? You know, (laughs) like where, how, how do you help parents make those kinds of decisions? Yeah. And everybody's going to land in a little bit of a different place. And yet what you're touching on is so important because I want my kids or I wanted my kids when they were still under our roof to experience enough freedom or things so that we could help shepherd them still in and through those things. I mean, if I was so clamped down and not allowing anything, um, because I was afraid of, you know, their failure or their safety or whatever, then, then what's going to happen. They're going to go to college and have free reign and have never had our input to walk through them even maybe when they make those mistakes. So, I mean, I would say gradually, of course, you know, when our child has really broken trust, we might have to pull back the reins a little bit and and step back. But I mean, as long as they are, um, you know, obeying or doing the best they can for the most part, uh, I think that we need to loosen the reins the older they get. And, And that goes with every, I mean, not just Carpew, but whether it's social media apps, um, friendships, making decisions, I mean, shepherd, we're still their guide and we're still their number one influence, even though we think that we lose that when they're teenagers, but they are still paying attention and we are still that number one shaping influence, but, um, we need to allow them be okay, be okay to make, they might make a mistake. It makes me think of when our daughter was a senior in high school and we had been super strict about curfew. And then all of a sudden it was prom and we had just been butting heads all week. And finally, my husband said, fine do whatever you want, stay out as late as you want. You make the decision. And all of a sudden she was paralyzed because now the pressure was on her to make these decisions. And he was like, no, I'm going to let you just navigate this night. If you want to go to that after party, then you do that. 
And we died laughing. She ended up coming home earlier than we probably would have made her because <laughs> she was just so like, oh my gosh, now the pressure is all on me. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah, that's so interesting. Okay, so Kristen, I mean, talk a little more about that middle ground, the not under parenting, not over parenting. Can you give us a little more of what that looks like? I mean, again, there's no formula, right? So we can't like, here's exactly what it looks like, but give us some maybe guideposts that we can follow. Yeah, I think it's so important that again, we start with our own hearts. And if we know our own hearts, then we can move toward our kids with compassion and grace. So instead of being shocked and immediately, you know, letting our anger fly or shaming comments, or how could you do that? Um, being surprised. I mean, no, we might be, but we have to leave our poker face on and we have to stay calm. And that may be that we need to excuse ourselves for a minute from our child and kind of calm down, pray, breathe, whatever we need to do so that we can talk rationally. I mean, if we are operating out of the emotional part of our brain and so are they, it's just going to escalate and it's not going to go well. So we need to be in a place where we can actually be logical if we're going to have any productive conversation. Um, And then again, the entering in part, I cannot overemphasize that. One, and and I may have shared the story with y'all before, but one of my sons, when he was a young teen, got caught with a vape. We could have immediately just said, how could you do that? You know, that's wrong. You're grounded. Go upstairs. Well, that would have just been separation and disconnection. It would have been just dealing with the behavior modification, like hoping that you learn your lesson. He would have gotten sneakier, but instead we want to get to the heart. And so how can I have a connecting conversation that gets deeper? Well, why did he do it? He didn't want to look bad in front of his friends. Well, I get that. I do things at times too, because I care about other people's opinions. And so that's my entry point. And it doesn't mean that he still, that he doesn't have consequences. Um, but I can enter in with compassion and grace because I understand what it's like to be influenced and care what other people think about me. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's always that, that middle ground, so to speak, is, is really thinking about connection and striving for the heart. And it means maybe a long road. It's not immediately fixing. It means they may fail and also remembering who we are in Christ and who they are in Christ. Because again, I think we so often, the reason we spin out of control is because our identity is found in our kids. And so if they do something wrong, then we must be a bad parent or other people are going to think we're a bad parent. So we have to continually have that self-talk with ourselves to remind ourselves that we're not a bad parent. We are imperfect and our kids are imperfect. And there's a lot of grace for that. And thankfully we have a savior who was perfect for us because we will Mm. fail. Gosh. I mean, that just preaches right there, right? Like where is our identity and, and are we letting go of outcome? Because, you know, are we enmeshed so much with our kids that what they do it has a direct, mm-hmm. you know, impact on the the arrow points back straight to us, or do we let them be their own individual? And do we do what we are called to do, but then trust God with their own autonomy and yeah. with what they decide to do as their own person? And it's huge. Stories. I mean, it's hard to live in the middle mm, of the story, not knowing good. how long this is going to go. Mm-hmm. You might, I don't know if y'all listen to Adam Young, but he was talking about this U diagram. And so if you think about like the Friday of the crucifixion, and then we have the Sunday of the resurrection, but we have to live in the Saturday of the Valley mm-hmm. of the desert of the death and darkness in order to get back to the Sunday. And really so much of parenting, especially when we're dealing with hard things and we don't know if our children, where they are, they might continue in making bad decisions and mm-hmm. whether it's drug use, having sex. I mean, there's so many things that we just want to fix it. And yet the story, God's writing their story and mm-hmm. it might mean sitting in a long period of a, of a dark Saturday, but we just haven't gotten to that, that hope, but we always have that hope ahead of us. If we can just sit in that tension of we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I hear people say that all the time, like God's writing their testimony. And I know that we can get tired because it's like, well, no, but I don't want that. And I don't want that for them. And, you know, but I, I like the story idea better because I think it helps us to kind of go back to that 30,000 feet and just to say, okay, God, what, what are you doing in their story? Because I know you're there. I know you're mm-hmm. in it and I'm going to trust you that this is a part of how you are ultimately drawing this child back to yourself. But that is a faith walk. Like that is hard. It is hard. I just had a mom ask me the other day, how can we not worry about all these things? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that is a loaded question. I mean, our propensity is to fear. I mean, it's why it's mm-hmm. in the Bible more than any other command. Do not fear. I mean, that is our human nature. But I would say I have found in walking the road with my teenagers is that the more they have, the more that there's been sin and struggle and failure, the more I have learned to depend on Jesus in a way that I didn't a decade ago. And so Mm. now, even in the hard, and this is not perfectly by any means, because I still can like default back to wanting to control, but I do trust him more because I've seen in some instances we've gotten to the, the other side of the story. And I've seen where he loves my children more than I do. And that ultimately I am not in control. And so I can do all the things. And yet ultimately, if the story is still being written, I can't, I can't change it. Mm -hmm. I can't rush it, I guess is a better way of saying that. That's a great way to say that. It reminds me of that. Also that book codependent no more. And Mm -hmm. how so often, like, we don't realize we're codependent and we don't realize like it's bleeding in to all these relationships in our home. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just what codependence is and how that may be impacting our parenting? Yeah. I mean, we can look to our kid again. I think it kind of goes back to identity. If, If we're looking to our children to, you know, um, be our identity to get it all right, then, then we are dependent on them making the right decisions and performing well and doing well. And, and so we will manipulate and nag and control in order to try to, to get that, that we want. Um, so separating ourselves from that and to realize that they are their own person, that Mm -hmm. they are, they're my children and I can, God's given them to me to shepherd over them. And yet they are their own individuals. And as, and the older they get, the more and more you really realize, like I have no control. I mean, mine are now in college or out and it's easier because they're not in my house. I mean, it's not easier to not have control, but it's easier to see that I don't have control. I think when they're still in our house, we have more of a false illusion that they are in control. Um, but someone gave me, um, an example back when my daughter was in high school, they had me envision a bubble around her that like she was in the center of the bubble. And I kept trying to crash into that. And that was causing a lot of tension between us. And so she said, you are on the outside of this bubble. She is in her bubble. You need to knock and, and ask or allow her to invite you in. And sometimes she will, and sometimes I need to stay outside of it. And so I think that can help illustrate that, like our, our codependency, we need to be in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's not good. The older and older they get. So we have to grow with them in that. And that can be really hard because when they're younger, they, they are more dependent on us. And it is a little bit, I mean, it is more of a dependent relationship. Sure is. I'm just picturing little kids crawling into bed and holding your hand and kissing you and wanting to be with you all the time. And then all of a sudden they're like, could you drop me off around the corner? So nobody sees you, you know, like <laughs> from crying when you leave the room to all of a sudden, uh, well, it feels like all of a sudden. So that's what we're kind of getting to is the surprising things that how did we get here? Wait, I kind of knew this was maybe coming, but I didn't think it would be coming this early or this soon. Um, mm-hmm. So maybe we can get into some of the surprising scenarios that parents face and, and maybe how we can ask ourselves, how do we not overparent, underparent? How do we walk in that middle line? Sure. Okay. So let's just, I mean, I think we just do this rapid fire and we burned through these and really talk about each one. And like, here's a scenario. And then as a therapist and as a parent, 
tell us what you would do. Okay. 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 So, um, a parent walks into their son's room. And again, this could be daughter, son. Okay. We're just going to use, you know, whoever it is. Okay. So walks into a son's room and they find a vape pen or a marijuana pipe. Okay. So like an overparenting parent is going to freak out. Right. Um, I mean, I often have teens come to me <laughs> to counseling because that's exactly what happened. Their parents freaked out and they send them to counseling and not necessarily that counseling is a bad thing, but I think that that is our first response for sure. Um, we want to manage a control. And so, you know, our inclination is to yell, like, how could you do this? And in fear, because again, our brain spirals to what if, and it, it goes so much worse. Um, an underparenting parent, I mean, they could pretend they didn't see it or justify that it's not as big a deal that everybody's doing it. I mean, I hear that a lot. I don't know about y'all. Um, a oh, yeah. lot of times what I see too is teens are going to be teens. They're going to do this anyway. So I might as well just let it be a safe place to do it here, especially when we're talking about like maybe alcohol was found in the room. So I'm just going to let them drink here so that they're at least safe. Um, I would say a better way, I mean, we do have to be, our kids do need boundaries and consequences. And yet it, I'm also saying that we need to enter in and seek to have compassion identification. So having those heart conversations, those heart conversations though, don't just happen when they're teenagers, we need to build upon them layer by layer and, and build that connection with our children. So they feel safe to talk to us. But again, like I said earlier, they don't feel safe to talk to us when they just see us freak out and we shame them. So working on that all the time of building that connection so that we are a person that they feel safe to share with um, so that they don't try to hide it better next time. Um, but, it, and then it goes back to, that it's tough to trust God with this. Um, and, and professional help may be exactly what's needed, but and I'm a therapist. And yet I say, still parents are the number one influence. What I see so often is parents just outsource to the counselor or the youth minister. And then they just kind of think it's taken care of and it's on them. And instead of getting into the nitty gritty and maybe doing counseling together or, you know, working on communication and other things at home. Uh, I, a lot of times I feel the pressure from parents that I now have to fix their child and have to fix their child like today. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's another thing, knowing that depending what the issue is, it's, it's not going to just correct overnight. We're, we're in that Saturday part of the U it, we're in the middle of it and it takes a little time. Well, and that is something that I hear from parents a lot is, okay, we found it once and that was okay. And we talked about it and we went, okay. That's a mistake, whatever. But then when they find it the second time or the third time, um, that's when parents start to panic. Mm -hmm. And because then it feels like, oh, maybe this isn't just a one-time thing or my, my child's trying to be accepted thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is habitual use. Mm -hmm. So what, what do parents do then? Yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on the type of parent that you are, but the, lots of commands, lectures, grounding, thinking that somehow we're going to stop it. And again, I mean, I think counseling then is very necessary um, because addictions is real. And yet law is not going to change a heart. And so even if we are doing those things, we still need to be working towards the heart. Like, what is it that they are looking for? It always goes back to what is really my heart? What is it that I'm wanting? I mean, a lot of times drug use is a numbing, it's an escape. What are they trying to escape from? Or it's, I want to be cool. I want to be viewed upon by all the kids at my high school is the fun party guy or, you know, the daredevil, whatever it is, we have to be helping our kids get to what, what's driving this behavior. It's not going to just change because we tell them this is bad and this is wrong. Mm -hmm. That would be, I mean, we wish it would, that would be so easy, but, but no kids hear that. And it just flies over their head and, and they continue, like I said, to get sneakier. 
It's hard. Yeah. I think the hard thing is, do you still give them privileges? I mean, that's some of the conversations I've had with parents like, okay, so if I've repeatedly found this in my child's room, well, there goes the car mm-hmm. or there goes that, you know, that, um, the phone, whatever, whatever they're using as currency, because, and I'd love your, I'd love your take on this, but you know, their perspective is, well, you can choose to do that and you will choose to not have some of these privileges, you know, like I, yes. a car or a phone or whatever. So I agree. what is your if, take if it on connects that? to what's happening? So certainly uh, mm-hmm. taking away a car or, um, if we're giving them money, I mean, maybe they need, they have to have a job. And maybe, but I, I think there, there needs to be a connection of what we're taking away that makes sense with hmm. what's happening. So often what I see, and this isn't necessarily with, um, well, it is, I mean, I see, you know, parents will find an alcohol bottle or vape or something, and they just kind of indefinitely ground their child or they take away their phone. That's just kind of their go-to. Well, that doesn't necessarily connect for the kid hmm. that, I mean, it doesn't change the behavior. So, but I do think that there's things, especially like a car or a phone, when it's a repetitive offense, the same thing that we need to make it really hard for them to have access to wherever they're getting the drugs or whatever it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Which gets to another, let's do the second scenario. You really don't like the friends that your child has chosen and you really feel that they're a bad influence on your child. What do you do as a parent? Oh man, that's so hard. And all these things are just hard. I mean, we could ban them from their friends. Um, I've seen people changing schools, uh, talking poorly about their friends, but usually what I see then is the child. Um, I mean, they take personally what we say about their friends because to them, it's an extension of their identity. And so if we don't like their friends, then they're they're going to be sneakier about it. Um, They're going to close up. They're not going to talk about it to us. So I think a better approach is again, going back to the heart, how, like, what is it that you see? What is it that you like about these friends or tell Mm -hmm. me about them or inviting these friends into our home, seeking to Mm -hmm. get to know these friends. Um, So, I mean, I'm not saying that bad peer influence is not something that we need to, I mean, we may need to try to stop it. However, like our children are autonomous and they were not in play groups anymore. We're, we're making their friends with, for them. They are choosing their friends, but we should be having those conversations about what is it in these particular friends? Or have you noticed that since you've been hanging out with these type of friends, I've noticed this X, Y, Z with you, um, helping to draw out their hearts and, and ideally then naturally they would maybe start to see like, this isn't the best group for me to be with, but it'll go a whole lot better if we help shepherd them through that. So it, it becomes their idea to leave and actually a heart change instead of we're banning them. And so now they're going to be sneaky. Mm -hmm. Is there a proactive approach? Maybe it's easier with younger kids queens than teens, but to say, Hey, why don't we invite (laughs) other friend over here, um, over to try to help also foster some relationships with kids that we think may be a healthier, uh, dynamic. I, yeah. And you're right. I'm thinking more middle school, maybe. Yeah. A little bit easier, probably with, with middle school. I feel like Mm -hmm. by the time they get in high school, they've not that friend groups can't change, but they often gravitate to exactly who they want to be with, or they're with the the people that they do activities with. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's harder to get them to, I mean, kids start to think that they already have, everybody already has a friend group. And so it feels very awkward to them. If we were to say, Oh, let's invite this person over. Like they would feel like that is so awkward because they're in a totally different friend group. Even though as adults, we might be way more open to being inclusive to all different people. They, they feel like they would feel very insecure with that, with someone that they don't really know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have just really found that making connections with the kids, friends and really caring about them and knowing about their lives to the point where they feel connected to me, it's been one of the most helpful things to do because then 
it's like their friends have a certain accountability to me as someone now that they're in relationship with too, that I'm no longer like just someone out there. It's so-and-so's mom. Oh no, this is like a person and I have a relationship with her. And that has made a huge difference. I a hundred percent agree. I think if we can be inviting the kids into our home, participating with them, that that's the best thing that we can do. They feel and so many kids in counseling, they feel like they are not seen, known, loved by their own parents. And so we tend to think that teenagers don't want to be around adults, but Mm -hmm. that's not true. If an adult is showing them attention and wanting to get to know them, they love that. Unfortunately, so many of these kids don't have that. And so to have them into your home and doing what you're talking about, they love that. And that might be that, I mean, Pete's a pastor, as y'all know, but he used to have like fireside chats out in our backyard and teenagers would just gather. And Rebecca sometimes would be like, dad, oh my gosh, are you going to really talk about that? Mm -hmm. But kids were happy to talk about anything he brought up. And I think Mm -hmm. it was just that it was a dad investing in them and caring Mm -hmm. about what their opinions were, what they're thinking about. It goes Mm -hmm. so far. So I think that is a huge way as parents that we can be proactive in seeking to form friendships with their friends. Yeah. And genuinely love them. Like when we genuinely love people, it does matter. It makes an impact. And then there's that relationship there. So it's so good. And our, I have also seen that my kids love it when I love their friends, Mm -hmm. like, right. The opposite is true. So they, like if, if we're not approving of a friend, they know that, and they know we don't like that friend, but right. Like they, our kids know, like they know whether we say it or not, but actually when, when they see me loving their friends, like that lights them up and that actually improves our relationship. So isn't that an interesting dynamic too? It is. And I will say it's so fun. So now, I mean, our daughter's married, but she's at the age where friends are getting married. And I cannot tell you how much fun I had recently at a wedding dancing with her friends. And some of her friends now live in the same city I do. And so we'll have them for dinner. Our daughter doesn't live here, but her friends will come over and have dinner. But that all started because we invested in them when they were teenagers. And now we're still you know, we text, we have them over and and my daughter loves it. Like she, when we sent pictures of her friends at our house in Dallas, having dinner with us, she, it just like made her so happy. Yes. Oh my gosh. So good. Okay. You ready? Next scenario. Okay. Okay. The next one, you get a report from your child's school that your son or daughter has been bullying another student. Hmm. Yeah, that is very serious. And it's happening, happening a lot, like serious consequences. Um, it's interesting. I I've seen over parents and under parents kind of initially respond the same way. And that it kind of goes back to my kid would, would not do that. I think Mm -hmm. sometimes we want to minimize it and think that, Oh, they must've been provoked or something must've been done to my kid because my kid would never say or do that. Um, and so we, we maybe aren't willing to really hear what it was that our child actually did or said again, that too goes back to identity. Like if our identity is wrapped up in our kid and our kid did something or said something really hurtful, then we feel like a really bad parent. And so that's so humiliating to us, if, especially if another parent or a school administrator calls us about something like this. Um, in terms of parenting, I mean, helping our child get to the, well, one, understanding the seriousness of it, but having our child see, own it. I mean, we can't, if we're minimizing it, then our child is also going to minimize and dismiss it. Mm -hmm. But if we can help them see like, why were you pulling that other child down to elevate yourself? Like what, what were you doing? What was going on in your heart? And then having that child own it, which looks like confessing and seeking forgiveness and going to that child, that other child or whoever it was, um, so that they see like, this is like, we do need to deal very seriously with, with this, um, in repair and asking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what if your child's on the other side of that? What if they're being bullied and you actually didn't know? Hmm. And that happens to a lot. That's hard because if we didn't know, we didn't know. Um, and I think parents then beat themselves up because how did they, they miss this? Uh, and I wish I could say, oh gosh, if we just built a better connection, then maybe our kid would have shared this. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. not. Um, mm -hmm. But I will say intentional connection where we are paying attention to our children's nonverbal body language. So often parents we're so busy, we're going in a million different directions and we're often multitasking. So we're maybe on our cell phone or laptop as we're talking to our child or we're cooking dinner or we're driving mm -hmm. them to practice and they, we may miss signs. Um, and I don't want to say that to shame any parent if you've missed it, because I think all the time we miss things and we want to beat ourselves. And yet we do the best that we can. Um, but I also think that sometimes we just aren't really paying attention. And so if we notice things and, and counselors are trained this way to pay attention when someone comes in, like what is, what is their, um, outward appearance like, do they look disheveled? Do they look tired? Do they look, you know, blank eyes? I mean, just kind of paying attention to, to are there things, even if, if it's someone I've never seen in my life, I just kind of take notation of like, okay, I don't know yet if this is kind of normally how this person looks or if something's going on, but as parents, we know our children, we know how they usually look and were they normally bright eyed and all of a sudden they're kind of moping about, or they're spending more time in their room. They're closing themselves off. I mean, just paying attention to those those things that just kind of give us maybe an intuition that something doesn't seem quite right. Mm -hmm. And they may not admit it right away because they probably feel so much shame wondering themselves, like, is what this bully is saying, is this true about me? Um, so it's, it's hard work to have to draw out or try to draw out our children. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what if they won't talk to you? Because that's another, right? So whether it's this issue or another issue, mm -hmm. what if the teen, that's another scenario, um, is not willing to talk that all of a sudden they've kind of gone silent and you're mm -hmm. trying and you're doing your best and you as a parent, you're pursuing them. You are trying to be like this open, loving person, right? Non, non-judgmental presence. And they just won't talk. Yeah. I mean, I think those are times that, okay, who else can we bring in mm -hmm. a counselor, another person? I, it takes a village to raise a kid. So I think the more people that we can have investing in our kids, whether it's a mentor or coach or another, like a friend's parent. Um, and I don't take it personally, if my kid would rather not talk to me, but they're willing to talk to someone else, then that's great. Um, so bringing other people into our children's lives all along the best we can is helpful. Um, but I think in a, in a situation where they just absolutely won't talk, then I think that it may come down to like, you know what, I, I can't let this continue. I really, we're going to go see a counselor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And, and, and it, often I will have parents say to me, good luck. She's not going to say anything to you. And mm -hmm. I, I'm always surprised. I shouldn't be surprised, but, but they are normally happy to talk. They want to, they, they want to talk. They're either, they, they've been holding things in and maybe sometimes it's because they want to protect their parents. They're afraid that they don't want to see their parents burdened or become even more worried. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it is, you know, they are more likely to talk to a counselor or somebody else besides mom and dad. Mm -hmm. I think there's that element of we can't help you if we don't know what we're dealing with, mm -hmm. um, that we can articulate and say, okay, these are the things that the steps we're going to take as parents, but we're a little bit walking in the dark right now because you haven't given us the full picture. And so we have to walk with the information that we have. Mm -hmm. and, That's a great way of saying that. Um, so I think that is something that a lot of parents just have to reckon with is we are making decisions and that's the truth about parenting, right? We're always making decisions with the information we have mm -hmm. and we don't always have the full picture. We rarely have the full picture. And so we're trying, but I think bringing our teenager into that could be helpful to say, listen, I'm your mom and I have to make a decision here because there's a safety issue or there's a concern for your general well-being. 
this is the information I'm, I I have. So this is why I'm making this decision. Mm -hmm. And so that they understand that maybe holding back could impact how we're responding as parents. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. And it may be what's needed for them to then offer up some more information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next scenario. Um, your child has become obsessed with his or her body image, working out all the time, limiting eating, a lot of negative self-talk. What do you do? This one's so hard. Eat food related eating issues, body image issues. I feel like are different from say drugs and alcohol or other addictions because we have to eat and it's good to take care of our, our bodies to be healthy. Right. And so finding that, figuring out what that line is between maybe danger and this has become out of control and this is just normal taking care of ourselves um, is hard. I think our tendency is to want to jump in and quickly fix it, maybe not understanding the complexity. And it is such a complex issue because it's not really necessarily about the food or the exercise. It's about what's driving it, which is maybe I want attention, affection. I feel less than I feel worthless. Uh, and so again, getting to the heart, which takes time. And as y'all know, my daughter struggled with an eating disorder and it was really a seven year journey and it wasn't always in the pit, it was more of a, just a roller coaster where she would be somewhat seeming recovered and then it would spiral back down again. And so I really learned on, from the parent side, and this was especially hard for my husband, that our words didn't hold the weight that they did when she was little in terms of telling her that she's beautiful or you know, God made you in his image. And I mean, we want to say mm. those things and those things are true. And yet in the thick of it, she, it, it just didn't compute. She couldn't mm. believe it. And so she needed lots of counseling and lots of really coming to a place where she really, really rested in the truth of who God is for her and who she is. Uh, Jess Conley, I don't know if y'all are familiar with her. She's yeah. book breaking free from body shame. It's mm. one of the best I've read on this topic because she really gets to the roots and dealing with like re reframing um, that our bodies are good. And like, what was our, what is the purpose of our bodies? And so I think that that's a really helpful tool. Uh, but again, we have to with this body image, especially if it's restricting food and we see significant weight loss and obsessive exercising, we need medical professionals and for eating disorder treatment, you really need a full medical professional team. You need, you know, a, an MD, you need a dietitian, you need a counselor. Uh, you may even need more than just outpatient counseling, but inpatient. I mean, eating disorders, I think, uh, now fentanyl is the, the biggest killer, but otherwise eating disorders is, um, the greatest mental health killer, which seems mm. like, wow, you would think alcohol or drugs or something else. But, um, I think I, the statistics was someone dies an hour a day from eating disorder. Whoa. What? There's so much more just with our, um, just our organs shut down, just the harm that is done to our physical bodies that no one can even see um, that's happening when we are restricting our food intake. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, that's sober. Hear, that's sober. You're right up. Yeah. I did hear that there was a, a spike, um, right. As people were coming out of COVID, mm -hmm. um, because kids weren't seeing normal bodies out in the world. They mm -hmm. were only being fed uh, I mean, just even regardless of how, how much a child was out in the world, there were just fewer people out walking around in the world. And that part of our understanding of what a human body looks like is seeing other human bodies that are real bodies and not Photoshopped and right. not angle pictured and all of that. So, um, if you're only consuming images from the internet of what bodies look like, then you kind of have this distorted sense of reality. So of course you're going to look at your own body through that lens of distorted reality. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I've also heard too that it's an increasing issue for boys. It is. It is more and more so. Eating disorders are certainly not just a female thing right now. And there's extra shame surrounding it when it's it's males because it's kind of thought of as something that females deal with. And so now when boys have eating disorders, there's just a whole nother layer of shame. Mm-hmm. But they too, I mean, because if they're smaller build and the the big football player body type is is kind of the mm-hmm. ideal image, then mm-hmm. then they too feel less than like they need to do more. And and sometimes depending on the body type that God gave us, we can't easily Mm -hmm. gain weight or grow taller or grow taller. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think a proactive side on that in terms of parenting is how we talk about our own bodies and Mm -hmm. treat food is so important. Like we should not be restricting food or labeling food as good or bad. And we talk about things as healthful moderation. So there's a lot that I see, um, our kids pick up on things they're observing, whether in the home or just in culture. And so there's a lot that we can do from an early age to, to change the way we even just think about our bodies and food. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kristen. This is so good. And your book parenting ahead is out and is available. And it's really meant, I think it's helpful for teenagers too. It's not just for preteen parents, but I do think every preteen parent needs it. And it's really kind of how do we set the table in the preteen years for the teen years? And so do you just want to talk a quick sec about that book and um, what you've got in there? Yeah. So I really have integrated Christian faith with counseling research. And so it deals with practical foundational things that we can do in our families, things that I've even mentioned already about just living redemptively and communication, what that looks like, and then dealing with our hearts, getting to what is in our hearts, having those spiritual conversations, talk about the overparenting and the underparenting. So I really, my hope is a therapist is, I mean, parenting is hard as we've talked about parenting teens is super hard. And so there's nothing that is going to make it necessarily easy. However, I hope as a therapist to see less teens in my office, like if parents are setting the groundwork and having these kind of communications and in doing things on the front end year after year after year, that what would that look like by the time their teenagers became teens? I don't know, but my hope is there's a lot. And I do believe that, that there's a lot that we can do in our homes and our families to help set that up. And even if they do need therapy, that there is that open communication and there's not rupture between the parent and child relationship. Mm -hmm. I love your charts. I think those are some of the most helpful things in the book, or you've got Mm -hmm. a lot of resources that is like, okay, here's like the gospel lens and here's, you know, the situation, here's the gospel lens. Here's, I I just love it. It's so good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kristen. This has been a great interview. Thanks for having me. I loved it. Okay. Rising up to parent teenagers. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, Kristen, we're going to do a little bit of a PS because there is a topic that we have a lot of people asking about. And that is, um, a parent suspects that their son or daughter is having sex or looking at porn. So I don't know if we want to lump those two together, but, um, what do you do as a, yeah. Okay. We can lump those two together. And really in today's world, we have to assume that our kids have been, or will be exposed to porn. Um, and I can tell you from doing college ministry, even back in the early 2000s that 90 something percent of the boys at that time, Christian boys struggled with porn. And that hasn't changed. I just saw a new statistic says that 71% of teens have done something to hide their porn use from parents. So this is a very real thing. And as is, we discover maybe that our children are sexually active and they've been hiding that. So, um, over parenting, and, and this is not a bad thing. So I want people to hear me correctly. I mean, like we resort to filter screen time, checking phone. I'm not saying those are bad. I think that those can be very necessary. Those will not change the heart though. And so I think we just have to know that like, yes, 
we, that's important part of like making it difficult as we were talking earlier about like, maybe we um, ban our child from the car or whatever it is. So putting those boundaries in place is not a bad thing, but we need to move beyond that and not just put our trust in like, oh, because we have this filter now they're not going to access porn. Um, and we've talked to about banning certain friends. Um, I think that that can be kind of, oh, you're banned from that girl or boy or from this friend group. Um, that That's not probably going to work. I mean, especially if our child thinks that they love this, you know, other person that they're having sex with. Um, so I would say the better way from the time, it, from as young of age as possible is have the conversation about God's good design for sex and the destruction of porn. And so just like my book talks about foundational things and we layer it, it's like layer upon layer, the older they get. And my friend, Megan Michelson with birds and the bees talks a lot about, um, drip, drip, drip. You know, we're just having these conversations. We're normalizing these conversations from as early of an age as possible so that we can talk honestly about sex and pornography. And so it doesn't have to be something shameful or hidden and we can help them, um, embrace, um, a right view of sex. And by not talking about it, they're not going to get that, but, but ideally we would want them to understand why it's worth protecting. Um, and the destruction that pornography does in real relationships. And so having those conversations that get to, to the heart of it, um, even if yes, we do maybe need some boundaries and maybe it's, if they're having sex, you know, that we, we have them not have as much alone time, or we have certain things we should, our, we need to teach our kids basically to be a good student of themselves. Like when are they, if, if, mm -hmm. it, if sex is the issue, when is it that they are most tempted or when is it, you know, that it's, it's easy to, to get away with it. And so teaching them to be a good student of themselves will actually go further than just like telling them no, or this is bad because ultimately they're going to go to college and they're going to live on their own and they can do whatever they want. And so I would rather be helping them, um, be equipped, um, to know why they want to not do these things and putting up structures themselves to help protect them from those. Yeah. And I'm thinking about literal like conversations that I've had with parents where maybe they feel that way, right? They feel that they're coming at it from, this is God's best for you, but the child doesn't feel that way and they don't subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. And so they are not motivated by that. So what kind of conversations do you have then when you're coming at it from really different worldviews? Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's so hard because we can't force them to adopt our worldview. And yet if that's the truth that we subscribe to, then then that's maybe the rule in our household that I'm not going to allow this in my household. Um, and that may be one of those really hard places where we're sitting in the bottom of the U on a, in, in a, in the Saturday place of like, mm -hmm. my child is doing this. And I know that they're continuing to do this. And yet because of my own conviction and what I believe is true, I'm not going to be party. I'm not going to make this easy for you to just do it. And I'm not going to just accept it. I accept and love you regardless, but, um, this is not a choice that is, I believe is for your best. And, and I don't think that we, we stray away from that. In fact, my daughter and I were just having a conversation, um, about some hard truth that she has been speaking to a student. She's in, in campus ministry and the student for several years has been living in a relationship that was not in accordance to biblical truth. And she just texted my daughter yesterday and said, thank you for being willing to still love me and still speak the truth. Mm -hmm. And she circled back around. And so again, we're, we're back to God's writing their story. And sometimes we can't control that they're making these choices that just are devastating to us. And that's really hard. And so I think this changes all of this that we're talking about today. It changes the way we pray for our children. I mean, it really, nothing like parenting puts me on my knees mm -hmm. than, than when they're in, in this place and we can't control and do anything about it. So, so Lord, please intervene. My prayer life has definitely increased as my children yeah. have gotten older. And I mean, you know, going back to the OG, um, praying scriptures for your children, stormy or, or 
Omarshan. Yeah, Omarshan. <laughs> Omarshan. Um, but she, I mean, her books are incredible. They really are. And they really help you pray specifically for your children in really beautiful ways. So I highly recommend her books. And they've been around forever. And they're still so good. So as far as just prayer life and how we're praying specifically for our kids, I'd highly recommend that. So Kristen, regardless of all these scenarios, we still can build connection with our kids. And in regardless of what's going on, that connection piece is so key. So can you just give just a quick snapshot of how you encourage parents to build connection? Yes. And we've hit on some of it. I've talked about paying attention to nonverbals, but, but 10 minutes a day, even just having eye to eye contact connection. And that helps them feel seen and known. Another thing is asking or being curious about our kids, not asking yes and no questions, but really being creative and intentional in the way that we seek to draw them out because um, it's very easy for them to answer a yes or a no or a one word answer and that's it. Uh, we also have to be thoughtful about when are we trying to have these conversations? I mean, mm -hmm. is it right when they get in the car or they get home and they're worn out from the day? I I don't necessarily want to talk right when I get home from the Or the morning, today. teenagers in the mornings. <laughs> yeah. And so right. being a student of our children so that we know like this really isn't the best time to be having this, this conversation. I think too, being intentional about planning things to that's fun that they want to engage in so that we're doing things with our children, because that's a lot of times when they naturally just talk. I mean, when I would go outside and throw the football with my son, all of a sudden he was like, just, you know, freely telling me all sorts of things to the point <laughs> where I'm like, oh my gosh, we've been out here now for way longer than I had intended. Mm -hmm. But, um, so we have to enter into their world. And, and sometimes that means, um, learning about, subjects or hobbies that are maybe not very interesting to us, but because we love our children and we want to connect with them, then we step into their world and do, we do everything that we can to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Kristen. Yes, so appreciate thank it. Thank you.